their worship and that they were offering up lame and blind and sick animals for sacrifice and so forth. So we know that some of that happened. And so, and they did so because they just thought or assumed that God had forgotten them. And so Malachi's answer is declaring that God is not some capricious God. Uh, he would fulfill his promise concerning the Messiah, but he'll do it in his time. Okay? Our job is to be faithful. Okay, it would be the same for us today, minus the Messiah. What do we look forward to as Christians? What are we looking forward to? His return. We're waiting for the Messiah, the Christ, to return so that we can reap the reward. But listen, it's been how long since the return? Almost, almost 2,000 years. And as a result, of it, there are going to be people says, where is the sign of his coming? Since the beginning of time, they've been asking, where is he? Why hasn't he showed up? It's been over 2,000 years. Well, before he came the first, the first time, it was thousands of years before he came. Okay, and it's been a thousand years before he has returned. But he's going to return. It's very easy for us to uh, assume that he's coming and then for us to get casual because he hasn't come. So we think we have all the time on our hands to get ourselves together. And the answer to that is no, we don't. Because you don't know when he's going to return. And so Malachi starts the third chapter by saying, Behold, or, or look. Did you know that there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the coming of the Messiah concerning his, his life and his death? 300 of them. And that's why I gave you that sheet there. That sheet has got four, uh, that has 44 of, of them that are messianic prophecies of Jesus, just 44 of the, the 300. Circumstances such as his birth, his lineage, and method of, of execution those things are all beyond his control, right? I mean, what man has any control over his, his birth time? I mean, did you have any control over when you were going to be born? When did you say from eternity? Did you kind of whisper in your parents' ears, okay, I want to be born on this date, in this place? You know, <laughs> you're right. See, they're, they're, th th he has no control over his birthplace. He has no control over his lineage. Uh, he had no control over his execution. Yeah. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about any man. Over what? Well, he's God, but in terms of humanly, I'm asking you to think of humanly speaking. You know, who of us have control over those things? Because what they're going to say is that, no, listen, anybody could have, anybody could have born in the birthplace in Bethlehem. Anyone could have done that. Anyone of given time could have determined their lineage. Anyone could have determined their execution, but, but not necessarily so. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, yeah, and what, what he said was that these prophecies were made 700, 600 years before Jesus comes on the scene. And so could have some human being manipulated the 300 prophecies so that they could have fulfilled them? You know, even, even eight of them, could they have fulfilled even, even eight of the prophecies? So a couple of fellows from the book that's sci called Science Speaks, Peter Stoner and Robert Newman, they just discussed it, they discussed the, um, uh, the mathematical probability of one man being able to fulfill uh, eight of the prophecies that Jesus uh, fulfilled. Just eight of them. Not mess 300 or 44 of them, but just eight of them. And what they did was they said that the, the probability of that happened was 10 to the 17th power. So if you're thinking what 10 to the 17 power is, that's what it is. And, and they likened it to taking the state of, of Texas and taking silver dollars and throwing silver dollars on the state of Texas that's two feet deep, taking one silver dollar and marking it as a specific dollar, dropping it somewhere in Texas, storing up the dollars, and then having a, taking a person and walking them out into the dollars blindfolded and then say 
Walk wherever you want, and when you're ready, bend over and pick up the dollar, and that will be the one. And you can see that it's an absolute impossibility that something like that could happen. It's statistically and mathematically an improbability. And so for Jesus to come and just fulfill eight of them, much less 300 of them, is absolutely, absolutely mind is absolutely mind blowing, and yet Malachi, 400 years before, says he's coming, and he's coming for a a pur- purpose. And so intimate was Jesus with this prophecy that he spoke about it in Luke the 24th chapter and verse 44. Open your Bibles to that section, Luke 24. And verse 44. This is after Jesus' resurrection. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So those 300 prophecies concerning Jesus that was written about in the law and the prophets, He said they must be fulfilled, and he is saying, and they were fulfilled in me. Uh, I am the one. So Malachi's prediction was was an effort, and the effort was to provide comfort and assurance to uh, to the faithful concerning God's justice, that they could trust in what's going to happen uh, concerning the words that he is going to give uh, to them. So then you have in your notebooks the Holy Savior, his person, and work so how does god answer the jews question where is the god of justice and his answer is that he says that he himself will come you're wondering where is the justice where is he He as well i'll come i myself am going to come how will they know that he is, is the lord is coming how will they know every eye was him but but look at malachi we're talking about Malachi's word. Look at Malachi. Look at the very first chapter. Behold, or look, I'm going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant. So how will they know that the Lord's coming? A predecessor. There's going to be a forerunner that's going to come on the scene. There is going to come one who is going to prepare the way so the messenger he says is going to go before the lord and so that's one of the things that israel or the jews are supposed to be looking for they're supposed to be looking for a predecessor now if you were to ask the jews today what who's the predecessor they don't know who's the messiah we're not we don't we don't know what he's supposed to be like but we know he's coming but they're not looking for a predecessor and what Malachi says here, he says there's a predecessor, there's one who's coming before him, there is a forerunner. Uh, four and later on in the fourth chapter in verse 5, he's going to identify this forerunner as Elijah. Question, is he, is he talking about Elijah literally? Is he talking about Elijah is going to come back to life? And the answer is, is that it's, it's, it's a type. Uh, he's not suggesting that he'll be resurrected to fulfill a mission, but that one is coming that will be like the Old Testament personality. It's going to be uh, like him. And of course, right off the bat, you guys are all ahead of me. You know where I'm going, right? You know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah, we're talking about, we're talking about John uh, the Baptist. He's going to come, and he's going to remove all the barriers which would impede the Messiah's coming. Look at over, turn back to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And notice verses 3 through 5. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be laid, made low, and let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. And of course, you know, what he's talking about is he's talking about John. That John is going to come, and he's going to clear the way. So remember, what you have to remember is Malachi is the last book written. There's been a 400-year gap of silence. And all of a sudden, this prophet rises up 
who, you know, has a camel haired cloak on with a belt around him, and he's eating wild locusts and honey. Okay, and, and he comes on the scene. And remember how the Bible describes him, how, how whole cities are going out to John. The masses are going out to John. And it worries the Jewish religious establishment. And so they get a group and they send them out saying, go find out who this guy is. Go find out what he is about. So, so Malachi, he, you know, 400 years before, uh, before John comes on the scene and before Jesus comes on the scene, he predicts the person and his work. And so this forerunner has to first appear before the, the Messiah. And so there's the identity of the Savior that is given, that Jesus is going to be coming as a Savior, and that he was going to be the messenger of the covenant. What does that mean, the messenger of the covenant? Any idea? Yeah, he's coming with a new, he's coming with a message. He's coming, remember the covenant must be fulfilled. He's coming with a message concerning the covenant. Let's just look at some of these passages of Scripture here. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Notice verses 1 and 2, and then uh, verse 4 says, God, after sp after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. He is a radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification for sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he inherited a more excellent name than they. Turn over to chapter 9. As the writer of Hebrews refers back, to this one that he's talked about here in verse 15. 9 and verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for a redemption of the rest transgressions that were committed on the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Go back to chapter 8. Probably should have started with chapter 8, but look at verse 8. But now he, that is Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, but in as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises, for if that first covenant, that's the old covenant, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second, the new covenant. Look at chapter 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and, the sprink, uh, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of, of Abel. So, so he, he projects, Jesus is projected, the Messiah is projected as the one who's the messenger of the covenant, and that he will come and become the fulfillment of God's covenant promise that he gave to Abraham. Remember what that promise was? By your seed, all nations shall be blessed. So he makes a covenant with him that he'll make him a new nation or a nation of people and that all nations will be blessed because he's pointing to the seed or to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ be then becomes the fulfillment of that promise made to Abraham. So Malachi's words were designed to bring comfort to Israel and dispel any cynicism about God's presence in their, in their lives. Then he talks about the impact of the Savior's work that's foretold. He says, who can endure this coming day? Who can stand when he appears? The messenger is coming. Who can endure it? Who can stand it? And then what he does, he, he says it's going to be really hard. It's going to be hard to stand and to endure his coming. Well, I asked the question, well, who's he talking to? Well, he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the priests, and he's talking to the people. But in a sense, he's also talking to us. He's in a sense talking to us. The Messiah is coming to judge his covenant people, uh, which is the Jews in this case here. And he's going to judge the priests. He's going to judge the people. What will his coming be like? He says his coming is going to be like a fire. It's going to, be a, it's going to become like a fire. Well, how does a silversmith purify silver? 
He sits in front of the service, the furnace, and he watches it. He watches all the impurities and the dross to come up, to be uh, pushed aside and so forth. He watches to make sure that the right degree is made. He watches it perfectly until everything is, is a purified work. And he knows it's going to be good when he sits and he looks at it, and he's able to see his face in it. And that would be like us. We're a royal priesthood. Uh, we come offering up spiritual sacrifices, but there's a purifying process or a cleaning process that we go through as, as Christians. And then he says it's like a fuller soap. Not as like a fire that's going to purify everything. It's going to be like soap or a fuller soap or a laundryman's soap. It's going to make it super clean. It's going to make the whites the whitest and so forth. And so both figures stress the Savior's work as the work of, of purifi purification. And that would be the same for us. We are the object of God's purifying. And so when we're baptized in the Christ, our sins are washed away or we are made pure. Or 1 John 1 and verse 7 uh, there says, if you walk in the light as he himself is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses you of all your sins. Now, the word cleanse there is that word katharizo. It means to purify, to cleanse, and that's what his blood uh, do does. So the Savior would cleanse his people so that their sacrifices would be pleasing to God. But I believe he's talking about the new covenant. When Jesus did come on the scene, no one changed anything. They still were doing a lot of the things they were doing, probably on the opposite end of where Malachi's day. On Malachi's day, they were super casual. In Jesus' day, they were over the top extreme. And how, remember last Sunday night how I told you, I think, or maybe it was Sunday, Sunday morning or Sunday night, I told you how in one of the hotels I stayed at, they had the, the Shabbat or the Sabbath elevator that's, you know, that is, has already been predetermined where it's going to stop on the, at the floors so that you don't even push the button. Remember one of the accusations against Jesus was that, um, is that they ate the wheat grains on the Sabbath. And remember they took the wheat grains and they put it in their hands and they did this here. Well, I did that while I was there. I took, we were in a wheat field, took wheat, we put it in our hands and we did this. And it left just the grains in our hands. And you could pop them in your mouth and eat them. They're kind of hard at first, but then they got, they'd soften up. Okay, well, they said, your disciples, they, they, eat on this, they are, are eating grain or wheat on the Sabbath. What were they doing? They said that was working. See how extreme that went? It was on the Sabbath, you were at a rest. And they went so, to the extreme that you couldn't even do this with a, grain, with a, a wheat head. You know, that's how far they went. And so by the time they were casual in Malachi's day and Jesus' day, they were on the extreme side of it. And you see how displeased he was uh, with that very, uh, very thing. So he's coming with fire, he's coming with soap, and there's going to be a cleansing. And he would cleanse us as Christians. He will cleanse us as Christians so that we had never oppress or deal treacherously or do some of the things that they did back in his day. We should be a different kind of people when his work is finished in us. All right, that's it. Thank you.